Good afternoon and welcome to Revit Structural Families. We had a longer title, Brian. Um, Revit Structural Families, CAD 1 and BD Mackey's joint presentation. My name is Stan Henney, Business Development Manager here at CAD 1, and I have with me Brian Mackey, uh, the Revit geek as he's known in the industry, and uh, founder of BD Mackey Consulting. So welcome once again, Brian, and I'm sure this will be a another good webinar. So let you bring up the usual slides here. We have our usual slide. If you want to um, move the uh, console out of the way, you can hit the orange arrow. Uh, why don't you all hit the raise your hand button and let's see if you can hear us. Just do a sound check. It looks like looks like the hands are going up, so that's good to know. So you're all using your mics and speakers and telephones or whatever. Most importantly, if you want to ask a question, feel free to do so during the presentation. Type it into the question box and we'll try to answer it as quickly as possible in context and get get things taken care of for you. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Brian. So this, this uh, webcast was deemed Revit Structural Families with Parameters. I thought I'd leave that off the title for you there, Stan. I didn't want to make it too long. <laughs> um, so what I figured today is I'm going to get into uh, just creating a, uh, taking a beam family. I'm going to take the out-of-the-box steel beam family. I'm going to put a void in that family and some parameters to get the void adjusted. I'm going to show you the little used tool of cuts when loaded option in any family. So I'm going to show you that option. Then I'm going to get into a step footing. I'm just going to do a simple single placement family. And if there's time, I'll jump into an adaptive family, or maybe I'll at least just display that adaptive family. So you can kind of see a difference between a normal family getting into that use and possibly an adaptive family as well. So with that said, I'm going to pretty much jump right into the Revit world. You know, Brian, I, I do want to make a plug here um, while we're online. Um, and I see quite a few people from Denver and area and a few from outside. Next Tuesday evening is the uh, monthly, the February monthly meeting of the Rhombus Users Group, uh, the BIM Users Group here in the Denver area. It's a good group, uh, well worth attending, and I always forget the name of that, that uh, um, the uh, meeting hall down there by the stadium. Uh um, so this this month, um, actually, I don't. This is going to be at Blake Street Tavern, I believe. Is it Blake Street? Yeah. Okay, Blake Street Tavern. Anyway, you can uh, Google Rhombus R O M B I S. So Rocky Mountain Building Information Society. O H. Yep. It's a meetup site. It's a meetup site and register. Great, great Revit resource. Great uh, BIM resource. So with that, um, and I think that starts at 5:30, does it not? It Brian? starts 5, uh, 5:30 for discussions and food, and then we get into um, the actual present. Well, it's round table, so I should say discussion at 6 p.m. So good enough. All right. So with that said, I'm just using an out of the box template right here, and I'm going to go just. I, I've drawn a wall to speed up the process and edit the profile. But I'm going to just basically start off by opening the out-of-the-box family. Uh, if anybody's ever seen some of my other presentations or definitely my wife's presentations, we'll get into, you know, you can always start with an out-of-the-box family and add to it. So I'm just going to go ahead and open the um, out-of-the-box um, Imperial Library. And I'm just going to go grab the white flange family. So I'm going to go into my structural framing. I'm going to go into steel. And I'm just going to grab the wide flange out-of-the-box family not going to do any trickery here so you guys all have this at your fingertips to go through and do what you want to do with it so i'm going to go to floor plans and i'm going to open up this floor plan so for those of you who haven't seen the 2014 versions of this there's a lot of different ways this is than the old ones if you're used to beam families in 2013 and all there were like all these calculation parameters and craziness going on with this family it's pretty easy You've got these reference planes off to the side. You've got a left reference plane and a right reference plane. And those reference planes represent the pick points when you're in a project. Then you've got this reference plane sitting here, which is called the member left. And this represents how Revit automatically snaps back the distance of the end of that family. So like if it comes in connection with a column or another beam, etc. So you've got that going in there. And then there's also, if you want it, symbolic line representation too, which I believe in 14 is the exact same location as the member left and member right. 
So I'm pointing that out because I'm going to come in here and I want to do a, a beam family. And I'm going to put an embed built. Or I'm going to build it in so we can do a beam pocket inside of here. Excuse me. And so what I want to do is use where I pick because I want to use the pick distance. If I use the snapback distance, which you can do that as well if you wanted to. So just depending on how you want to look at this, it's going to be from the end of where that member goes. So I guess maybe that some people might want that. So as you change the extension length of the end of that member, the void will go with it. I'm going to actually use where I choose the pick to. So that's just a couple things that I'm going to come in here. So I'm going to go start creating reference planes. Because anybody who's ever seen any of my sessions or anything that I do, when you're doing anything, for me, it's 100% creating reference planes. So I'm going to create a little vertical reference plane here. And I'm going to dimension to this vertical reference plane from the um, left reference plane that ex resides inside of there. I'm also then going to grab that reference plane, and I like to give my reference planes names. So this is going to be the beam pocket um, left. So it's going to be my beam pocket on the left, and I'll have a beam pocket on the right. Probably only going to do one side of this beam so you, so you can see what's going on. So there's my beam pocket, and I've dimensioned it. Now the reason we're going to go ahead and put dimensions on this is this is truly how parameters are going to be created. So I'm going to select the dimension, and with the dimension selected, I'm going to come up here and choose to add a parameter for this. So you can see that the parameters that already exist on a beam, the length, the flange thickness, all of those other parameters that are there, they're in this drop-down list, but I don't want to use one of those. I want to create my own parameter. So in this case, I'm going to hit the Add Parameter button. I'm going to go ahead and call this my Pocket Depth. And I'm going to, since I chose the dimension and came through here and said add parameter, it automatically chooses what the discipline and what the type of parameter is going to be for me. I have the availability to then change in the properties when we select it, where is this object going to be grouped? Is it going to be grouped under dimensions? Is it going to be grouped under division geometry? So any of these options you want up here, you can choose where you might want to have this, this set up to. I'm just going to leave it grouped under dimensions. And then you can make this type or instance base. I'm going to make this value instance base because I might come into a scenario where I want one six inches deep, one eight inches deep on a different wall, one four inches deep, or definitely there might need to be different depths depending on the size of the beam. So whatever you're going to want, I'm going to make this one instance based. Okay. So by selecting that dimension and hitting add label or add parameter to the label, what it's done is created a new family type parameter for me. So come in here, you can see I have pocket depth. So all that did was come in here and create pocket depth. I can tell it's instance based because it says default after it. But if you didn't like something about this parameter, you wanted to change the name, you wanted to change it from being under dimensions to maybe being under construction or anything else like that, you can simply grab that parameter and hit the modify. And maybe you've decided you wanted this to be under construction. So I'll move it up under construction or constraints or something like that. It doesn't matter to me. This is all personal preference. But what you can also do while you're inside of here is now just add other parameters. So I'm going to add a parameter for calling it pocket left. And I'm going to group this one also under construction. And I'm just using the tab key to tab through all of the different values here. And I'm going to make this an instance based parameter as well. You know, no, let's make this one type based. We're always going to want it to be given width from the beam. So we're going to say type based on that one. And then I'm going to add a new one called pocket right. And again, I'll group this under construction, and I'll leave it type-based. Okay? So you can create parameters in the Family Types dialog box, or you can select dimensions and create parameters that way. So I'm just going to go ahead and say OK to this. And then what I'm going to need to do is draw a couple more reference planes for where I'm going to want that pocket left to be and that pocket right to be. So then I'm going to do a dimension from the existing width of the beam to the exit to the new parameter and then I'm going to grab those and say label this as my pocket left and label this as my pocket right. And as I'm thinking of my names I might want to call it pocket side one and pocket side two because that's what Revit already uses in existing properties. Like when you say I want to change it it's offset to side one or side two. I should probably call it pocket side one, pocket side two. I'm just going to leave it for like that. So again, this is all just personal preferences on your names. So now I've got this set where I'm going to want the one side of this, the other side. I also need to think about this possibly in elevation views. So I'm going to expand an elevation view, and I'm not sure where Autodesk has the other parameters. 
So I'm going to kind of browse through to see is it in the back, is it in the front. It's not in any of those views. So I'm going to try to go to like the right or the left. Because I, I like to keep my stuff consistent. If they put it on the right, I want to put it on the right. I don't want to have half the dimensions in the front view and half the dimensions in the left view, etc. I like to keep everything pretty much consistent where we're going through and setting that up. So now I've got the left and the right preset up, I'm going to go ahead and create a reference plane and have the pocket top and the pocket bottom. So we'll go ahead and create one there. We'll just come down here and create another one here. And I'm going to go ahead and add a dimension. I'm going to go add some parameters for pocket top. Make that type based as well. And then we'll add a parameter for pocket bottom. Group it under construction. Did I do this? Sorry, yeah, construction and make that type based as well. All right, just going through and creating these. And you can also see that when I created them, they were zero inches, but once you assign them to the dimension, they pick up on what that dimension already happened to be. So I'm at 233, 256 of an inch. You're going to see that as I originally create this, in, this, this information, I don't really care where I put these objects because I'm going to parameterize and adjust them and fix them to see what's going on. I also realized that I forgot to give this one a name. I like to name everything. So I'm going to call that one the pocket top. I'm going to go ahead and call this one the pocket bottom. And you're also noticing that um, what I'm, you might be noticing what I'm doing is I'm changing the is reference value. So reference planes all have this is reference value. And what this is reference value means is when I load this project into, when I load this family into a project, how is this reference plane going to be seen when it's loaded into that project? So if I don't want anybody to dimension to this reference plane across the beam as they're, they're going and dimensioning maybe in a z-axis or anything, I'm going to make these say not a reference. So I'm using these reference planes to flex or change something in the model or in the family, but I don't want it to be seen when it's loaded into a project. So I'm going to make, I pretty much am making all of these reference planes not a reference. So I had the right, left, front, back. This is my pocket as well. So I'm realizing I forgot to name those two. So I'll go back and name those. I'm going to grab this one. I'm going to label this dimension, pocket top. Label this dimension, pocket bottom. I'm going to go back into my nice little plan view there. And I'm going to relabel these pocket. Make it not a reference. The reason I'm calling this pocket front and pocket back is because this is the way the families are, are set up inside of the Revit world. This is the front reference plane. This is a back reference plane. You'll notice this is called the center front back. So I'm just keeping with the Autodesk naming conventions. And you can't really change this from front, center front back to center left right if that's what you were thinking. I've tried that in the past. And if you do that, like um, opening by faces, don't work on the members. So I haven't tried it in 14. But I know that in the previous releases, you renamed this from center front back, or I shouldn't say renamed, re-is referenced it, then it actually doesn't allow a lot of the features to work. And Brian, excuse me, Brian Carey asks uh, the differences between the weak and strong references. It's a good question. So I'm making all my not. So like a strong reference, when you load it into a project, Revit's going to find that automatically. So it automatically snap next to something. But a weak reference means you might need to like tap to get something to snap to it or to possibly even dimension to it. So if I had it as a strong or named reference, a dimension is automatically going to snap to it. But if it's a weak reference, I might need to use the tab key to get there. So that's, that's part of the difference between strong and weak. The other thing is you'll see that there are names like front left, right back, center left, right, center front back, etc. Um, Autodesk uses the is references of the names for specific reasons. It understands the left is the left. So if you come into this beam or in this member here and you change his reference from left to right, weird freaky things start to happen and you guys can go experiment if you want to. Um, I pretty much always make sure that this is the left, this is the right, this is the center left right, this is the center front back. And some families I'll go and say, hey, this right here is going to be my center front back family. So it just depends on what's going on, but pretty much the left is always the left in plan and the right is always the right. I know many years ago I tried changing this center to be center left left, right, and like I said, opening my faces didn't work. I couldn't go from side one to side two on my families. A lot of weird things happen. So I try, I stop fighting it and just I go along with it now. So I've got this all set up. Now before I go do the extrusion in this family, what I'm going to do is start verifying did it work. 
So I do, really, do I really want that pocket distance to be, you know, 1 and 2, 33, 256? Do I want to make them both 1 inch? I'll hit the Apply button, make sure they adjust. You know, my pocket bottom, I'll go ahead and make like 2 inches. I'll make my pocket top like 3 inches. And I'll make my depth 1 foot. All right, just making sure everything's flexing and doing what it should be and I'm not getting any warnings. So now that that's done, I'm going to come in through here and I want to create a void in this family. And the reason I'm going to create a void for this is when I load this into a project, I'm going to be able to use that void to cut a hole in whatever it's, it's a touching. So I can use that void to cut a hole in a wall in this scenario. But if you also start thinking, if, you're, if you do a lot of precast work, I can take the um, inverted T-beam, put a void in there and have that void be the cutout on the daps for my double T's. So I used to create daps in all my double T families, but once they added this, I put a void in my inverted T beam, and that inverted T beam now has a void that automatically can create the daps in my double T's. So a lot of different scenarios and where you can use this. I know we've got a lot of architects, um, or not a lot of architects, but I see a couple architects on here. If I'm an architect, I could go in and start putting voids in like, um, one thing came to mind for me when I first saw this was sinks. All my sinks have a void, so I can have the sinks cut the countertops. So there's numerous different scenarios and where you can use this. I just thought I would show this with a structural beam family. Okay. So one thing I want to show that if I go in and create a void right now that off this extrusion, I'm just going to go do a void form um, just off here to side. That what happens when I do a void is the void is then going to automatically start cutting out my beam. Because this void is created after an extrusion, the void says, hey, I need to cut any existing extrusions. So a little tip I'm going to have here is I'm going to create a solid and then switch the solid to a void because A, it's easier to adjust the solid than it is a void, and B, then it won't cut out the existing modeled stuff. So this is a little tip that I always like to show people as I go through. So I'm going to go create extrusion. I'm going to check to see what work plane this extrusion is working on. So right now it's working on the reference level, but I really wanted to be working off that pocket bottom. So part of the reason I name my reference planes is I can associate a work plane to a named reference plane. So rather than doing this and having to stretch it and adjust it after the fact, I can just say, hey, no, let's work off of the pocket bottom value. Now when I go create this extrusion, it's one plane is automatically associated to that reference plane I created. So I've got that pocket bottom. I'm going to go do a very simple extrusion. And I'm going to make sure I padlock all four of those lines to the reference planes we've created. So we've created the reference planes. They're moving and flexing. I want to make sure that this extrusion is going to move and flex with it. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit finish. And I'm going to go into that right elevation. And I can see here's that beautiful solid we just created, and its bottom is already associated to that pocket bottom reference plane. Now I'm going to grab my align command, and I'm going to align grabbing the top, the pocket top reference plane, and align and lock this extrusion to it. So I've created my extrusion. You can see it looks pretty funky because now I've got this big solid extrusion. Wow, really? The crop region is turned on on this? That was pretty weird. So I've got this big solid extrusion, and I don't want this to be solid extrusion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this family now, and in its properties, you can say, is this a solid or a void? A solid can become a void. A void cannot become a solid. So if I go create it as a void now, I can go change this one back to a solid since it started as a solid, but usually the voids can't get changed back. I did not do that. The voids can't get changed back into, or can't get converted into a solid. And so now you can see when I created this, it's not cutting this beam family at all. I don't want it to cut the beam. I want it to cut the host. Okay? So we've got those values. Again, I'm going to go into my family types. Like I'm sure you've heard everybody preach in any Revit family session is we want to start playing with the parameters. So the pocket on the top, I'll go make one inch. I'll make the right pocket half of an inch. I'll make the left pocket half of an inch. And we'll make the depth only like four inches deep. And we'll make the bottom, I don't know, I'll leave the bottom, oh, one and a half inch on the bottom. The apply button and make sure everything adjusts. Okay. So that's creating the parameters in the structural family. But we also want to be able to say, I want this to cut an object when I place it in, or have the capability to cut an object, I should say. 
So this is this little property that they came out with, I think it was in 2012. I know they refined it in 13 and 14, but I'm pretty sure. So first release it came out, it didn't work that great. Not everything would get cut. And I know they've refined it in a couple of releases since then. So I'm going to make sure I have that little cut with voids when loaded checked in there. So with that said, I think this is done. I'm going to go ahead and load this into the project. I'm going to go ahead and say project 2. I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to say let's overwrite the existing version. So now I'm just going to come in here and model a beam. I overwrote the existing out of the box version. I probably should have done save as first, but so we're good. There's the wide flange. I'm just going to pick on here that wall and come back. Okay, so now I'm going to go into a 3D view. And I'll go put this into shaded mode, right? So we can kind of see that I've got this object in here. And you can see that there is that void in that beam, but the void is not cutting that family out. So what I'm going to want to do is say cuts with load. So by what you do when you say that cuts with fam lo void when loaded, you have to go to the Modify tab, grab the Cut command, and say I'm going to cut the wall by this beam. And now you can see, well, it's not really a beam pocket, it's a beam notch, but I have that beam pocket inside of there. So now if I select this family, I can go to my Edit Type, and rather than that only being, um, oh, did I, make, I made that one instance space. Sorry, that one's instance space. So now I can come into here and find my pocket depth and say, gee, I wanted that pocket depth to be one foot. And now it's going to come back and cut that notch out of the wall for me. So I've just taken an out-of-the-box family, added some voids to it, and did a beam pocket. Right? I also want to represent that this is sitting in the beam pocket. So I'm going to go grab my Modify tab. I'm going to grab my Edit Beam Column Joins. And I'm going to hit the little blue arrow to tell Revit that that's truly sitting in a, in a beam pocket. And if I go into Thin Lines, you're going to see that it goes to where that pick point is of that family. So maybe I'm understanding that, oh, wow, when I say it's in a beam pocket, there should probably be a little bit of fluff there. I don't think we're going to, you know, snag, snug this into concrete that tightly. So I'm going to go back into my family, and I'm going to go to the reference level of this family, and I'm going to create a left parameter for this. So let's just go create another reference plane. So as you can see, if you do something and that something isn't exactly what you wanted, you can always come back and change it. So I'm going to do a dimension... I'm going to go ahead and add a parameter to that one. I'm just going to call it the pocket offset. You might not like my names. I'm completely okay with that. So now we've got this pocket offset value I've adjusted over here. I'm going to take the pocket depth and move it from there to there. So now my pocket depth is going to be from the whole value. And I'm just going to relabel that parameter to be the pocket depth. Okay. Now my extrusion, I need to edit the extrusion and unpad lock this constraint and move it over by aligning and locking. Finish that family. Load it back into my project. Just say overwrite. And now we can see that that pocket depth is going in deeper than what the extrusion is. We can probably go into a medium level of detail here. Okay, that's probably too much. Oops, grab the beam, not the view. That's probably too much, so I can go take my pocket offset. I probably left it under dimensions, and we'll just go ahead and make that, I don't know, half of an inch. Not half of a foot, half of an inch. So now you've completely parameterized the capability to go in and have that beam pocket inside your family. All right? And you can take this one step further. Um, so Desiree Mackey, I think it was at Central States, it might have been Autodesk University. Um, it's probably Autodesk University, but she did a lab on this where she gets really into, well, what happens if this beam is sloping? Because if I come in here and go, let's make this four feet, I made it perpendicular to the end. So she added some values in there to change the angle at the end so the beam pocket is always going to be flat and going to be perpendicular. So if you really want to get in-depth into this beam pocket family, um, search for some of her papers, either at Autodesk University or RTC or possibly Central States Workshop. I forget where it was, but I know she did it on one of them. So kind of the same scenario, but if it's just all straight beams, it's going to work beautiful and you can see what it's doing there. And the nice part about this that I always like to show is let me just go ahead and make this pocket depth like three feet, just to make it a bit excessive. 
If I go put another wall in here, it's not like it's going to put the, the hole in that other wall as you go through. So I'll draw another wall here. All right, terrible example, but you guys will get the point. So that, that bean pocket, it doesn't cut it automatically. So this isn't an automated tool of, hey, by the way, I just go through and cut. You have to tell Revit, I want to cut this object, in this case the wall, by this other object, in that case the beam. So not like it's automatic. It's not going to go cut out other structural framing unless you tell it to. So it isn't just, hey, I'm going to automatically do it. You have to physically go say, cut this by that. And I do know there's some MEP people I see on here. So one thing on that, too, is I've worked with, as long as you're modeling walls inside of your office, so if you work for an AE firm, I've actually modeled MEP connectors with the same theory, put a void in the MEP connector. Whenever there was a wall, I just put a connector, or in this case, it was going to be some sort of like um, damper or anything like that because it was a smoke wall or a firewall. And then I built the void in there, so then I could just say cut the wall by this connector. And I automatically, as I move my ducts around, change sizes, automatically get the hole through the wall. Again, you have to have the wall inside of your project, but it does work if you are doing that. So same scenario on that hole cuts wall with what loaded. Now, Brian, I noticed across the top, and I'm sure everybody out there probably knows this, but there's the green, yellow, and red line across the top. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's uh, see what that's about. So those are just your analytical model lines. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm, I have it down here to say show analytical models and I can say hide and say show. So that is getting into the analytical side of your model. So that's what's going to get exported if you go out to Risa, RAM, Robot, any of those programs. So that's what is going to be getting exported. And you have complete capabilities of adjusting that too. I believe we did a webcast on that already last yeah, year. Yeah, just, just, you know, since it's appearing on here, I wanted people to that, that might not know what that was about anyway. Well, there you go. I'll just hide it so you're not yeah, going to see anymore, Stan. Quit pestering me with that. <laughs> Quit pestering me. <yeah. laughs> All righty then. So the next family I wanted to create is I want to talk about step footings because for me, I'm always amazed that out of the box, Revit doesn't have a step footing family, right? So how do we make this step footing adjust, do what we need it to do, get our nice little slope, etc. So I'm going to go start from scratch to create a step footing family for this. So I'm going to go new family. So application menu, new family. And I'm going to go down to structural. And I'm going to grab the structural foundation command. All right, so we're just starting with structural foundation template. And when you start getting in here and looking, some templates you start with will have parameters already associated with it. So if I go into my family parameters, there's already a structural material, and there's also a length and a width value. So some families automatically give you, hey, this is something that's going to come in, what we're going to do, you have that capable for you. Some family templates you start with, you're going to have absolutely nothing. So it just depends on which family template you start with. So as you're going to be able to see, it's going to be a whole lot of the same thing. The biggest question you have to ask when you start creating a family is where is the insertion point? So we started with the a line based family that was a beam, the start point, the end point, that's your insertion points. But in a family like this, the other thing you'll notice on reference planes is there's this little checkbox here that says defines origin. That defines origin says, hey, this is going to be my insertion point. So I can leave that as the insertion point, or I could grab a different reference plane and check defines origin on that reference point if I wanted to. For me, I want this to be center on the insertion point. Maybe you want it to be on an edge, completely up to you but there's different ways to go through and do this. So I'm going to leave my insertion point centered here, but I do want the insertion point not to be centered left to right. I do want that insertion point to be on, in my case, the thick side of the foundation. So I'm going to leave this to defines origin, and I'm going to come up here and relabel this reference plane to be the left. So I'm going to grab it. I'm going to change the name. because I like, I like naming my reference planes, and I'm going to go ahead and say the is reference is the left. Then I'm going to grab this other reference plane I drew in. I'm going to call it the front. And of course, I'm going to change use reference to match, and I'm going to call this one the back. So I've got my left, my front, my back, and my center front back. I'm going to go create another reference plane in here, and one more just for fun. This reference plane, I'm going to give it a name of slope start. I'm going to leave it a weak reference. Somebody might want a dimension to that. And then this is going to be my right. 
Take my left, my slope start, my right. We're all looking good there. I'm going to start dimensioning this. So I need to come in here and dimension these objects. And I did say I wanted it to be centered. So since I want the insertion point to be centered, I'm going to do a dimension string and hit the equal button. So if one side moves, the other side moves equally. I'm then going to go through and do another dimension. And I'm going to go ahead and make this dimension be the width. I'm going to go do a dimension for my length. All right, and we've already got that length parameter in there. And then I'm going to do a dimension. And I know there's probably a technical term that's not coming into my brain right now, but I'm just going to call this the flat part. <laughs> I've got length, width, and flat. Okay, so I've kind of got these reference planes all set up to create this footing in plan, but I've got to think about what is happening in the z-axis. So I'm going to go into my um, front view or my back view, it doesn't really matter. You can see I've got the left here, I've got the flat here, right? I just called it my slope start, and then I've got the length. So I'm going to need to create a reference plane for my thickness or my depth or whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to give this a label. I'm going to call this the bottom. And I'm going to give it a label of bottom. Oh. Well, see, now that I've mislabeled this one, I called it back. What happens in that scenario is and then it's got rid of the is reference here. So I need to call this one the back again. So what happens when you move your mouse off the properties before you're ready? I got my bottom, and you're also going to see that there's a reference plane behind this level. And this reference plane, it's there for insertion reasons. This is defines an origin, but it also doesn't necessarily give it a name or an is reference. I want that to be defined as the top. Just in my brain, it's making more sense. Okay, so I've got my left, my right, my flat. I think this is working pretty good. Oh, I need a height parameter. So I'm going to dimension this, and I'm going to give it a thickness parameter. So now we've got the thickness, width, length, height. I think we're all good to go. So now in this scenario, rather than doing an extrusion in plan, because I want this to taper, I'm going to go ahead and just do an extrusion from the side. But again, I want to know what work plane am I using here. So I'm going to go ahead and set the work plane. And I'm going to say I want the work plane to be the front or the back. In this case, I'll say front. And I'll say OK. So now I'm going to go do extrusion. I'm going to use the line command. I'm going to uncheck chain. And you'll see why here in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and then just start drawing this reference line. And you'll notice that if chain is unchecked, I get padlocks that come up. So I can padlock this line as I'm drawing it. If I have the chain command turned on, it will not give me that padlock as I'm going through and doing it. So if I go in here and I'll just do a line again, I'll have chain turned on. Once I draw a line, the padlock shows up, but the second I move, I'm going in to execute another line command. So the, the padlock goes away. So personally for me, I like to have the padlock or the chain unchecked so I can just do the padlock. Now the other problem I have is I've drawn these lines, but this got constrained to this reference plane, but it's not constrained to this flat reference plane. Also, this reference line or this sketch line is not constrained to my right reference line. So what I need to do is align and lock the endpoints. That means now no matter what happens to that dimension or as that moves, those endpoints are now constrained to those reference planes. And once I get those aligned and locked, I'm going to just simply connect the dots. And I'll finish the extrusion. So I go back into my plan view, and you can see, hey, there's my extrusion. It went across there like that. And some people care that it went the wrong direction. Some people wanted to do something else. So one thing that I want to show you is if you did want to try it on a different reference plane, all I have to do is select the object. I can edit the work plane. And instead of using the front work plane, maybe I'll use the back work plane. Some people freak out if they stretch it back upon themselves and get a negative value for their extrusion end. It doesn't matter in the Revit world that I've found. But if you do care, you can change work planes that easily. So now that's changed. I'm going to go align and lock my other edge. And then last but not least on this one, I want to assign a material parameter to this. So I'm going to select this extrusion, come over to my material, 
and add the parameter for that structural material. Okay, and then we'll go to 3D, and we'll start playing with some of these numbers. Let's just go say our width is going to be 3 feet, our thickness is going to be 1 foot, our length is going to be 6, and I don't know, our flat will be a foot. So as you can see, playing with it, flexing it, making sure everything is going to be working and doing what it needs to be doing. So it kind of works pretty well. It looks like it. Now, the other thing that you can do, and I know there's different rules, and I, I, I know everybody says, no, this is the code for that. But, of course, I've heard that in six different ways. But one thing I do want to show you that you can do is if you wanted to, you could make the length be determined on the how large the flat is or vice versa. How big is the flat determined by the length? So if I'm just going to come in here and say, hey, this is going to be 10 inches, I might want to say, you know, the length is going to be the flat distance times 4. So now I know that the length is always four times greater than that distance. So if I go change the length to be four feet, it's also going to change the flat distance to be a different size. So I know some people tell me, oh, it's always absolutely this way. Some people tell me, no, it doesn't matter. So it just depends. I've heard like six different ways this can happen. You can add formulas in there if you want to. I think that's one of the beauty things of doing something like this. Okay? So I'm going to say, okay. I'm going to go ahead and load this into my project. And now you're going to see I've got this beautiful family here. So I'm going to cancel out of this because I think it's easier to place these in a floor plan. So I'm going to go down to my level one. All right, and I can see where this wall is stepping, obviously, right here. Uh, I don't know if I can see the other step because I'm probably below the step because I went up a few feet. So I'm just going to go edit my view range. I'm going to make this three feet and make that four. There we go. So now I can see where those are. I'm going to go to either the structural foundations command, because we did say this was a foundation, so I could do an isolated foundation, or I could go to component. I'm going to go to isolated foundation, and now you can see I've got this family here. Space bar will rotate it, and then I can place this where it needs to go. We'll rotate it over here and place it over here, and you can see it's all been placed. If I go back into the elevation, um, the height might be in the wrong location. In this case, the height is in the right location. But this one, the height wasn't. So I can move it up, or it could possibly be the fact that it's the wrong size. So here's two things I wanted to point out. One of the things that we can do is make these type properties like I did. So I can come over here and really define this. And I'm going to go ahead and rename it from Family 4. I'm going to say this is three feet wide by one foot thick, and then the length is four feet. All right, so three by one by four. And if I needed another one on this, this is two feet tall. So I'm going to go ahead and edit the type and say duplicate. And this is a three feet wide by two foot tall, and maybe we want it to be six feet long. All right, so three feet, our thickness is going to be two, and we'll make the length six. Okay, so if you make them type-based parameters, you have the capability to go through and change that up and see what they're going to be. But every instance you're going to have of this, you're going to need a new type. I'm going to need a three foot by two foot, you know, 18 inch step, there's a 16 inch step, there's a 24 inch step, and you end up with a whole lot of different types. So this is one way to do it. You also see that I forgot to change the material on these, so I'm going to go ahead and edit type, and I'm going to go do my material as my concrete. So concrete, there we go. I think it's going to be cast in place gray. And say OK. There we go, and this one will be the same material. And the only reason I'm changing the material is so the joins look a little bit better. Right now you can see the hard-coded lines because they're different materials, and if I make it the right material, then the joins go in there. Okay? So the other thing you do is if you're like, you know, I'm okay with width and length being a type property, but maybe height needs to change. Because I'm going to have four-foot-long ones, three-foot-long ones, three-foot-wide, whatever you're going to want on there. All that simply to do that, we have to do in the family is grab that parameter, and maybe we want to take thickness 
I modify and make it instance based. So now if I say OK, OK, we'll load this into the project. And so now what you'll see if I go to that north elevation when I pick it is I can just change the thickness to be anything I wanted it to be. So rather than having to have a different one for every different step size, we can go through and use a parameter to create one for the thicknesses. Oops. That's partially why I don't like little stretch handles is if you stretch it the wrong size, then you get that weird 256 of an inch offset. Okay, so just depending on you, I've created these for clients where everything's type based. I've created them for clients where the majority of it's instance based. So they can just drop it in place and stretch it where it needs to get stretched to. That's 100% up to you. I think the big thing for me is to make sure it is a structural foundation category. And the real reason why I like that to be a structural foundation category is if I go into visibility graphics and I go down and say, you know, I want all structural foundations to be dashed. So let's change the surface pattern lines, the surface lines, and let's just say we want them all to be dashed. Since it's a structural foundation, it will also be dashed like the rest of them. So that's kind of one of the big things to me. I see a lot of people leave these as generic models or something, and then they are asking, well, why aren't the lines turning dashed like the rest of them? So I try to make those all be the same category as what they're going to be. Okay, make sense? So I've got this other family type loaded over here. I'm just going to go ahead and delete these. I've got this other family type already preloaded in here. I'm going to close some hidden windows. So this family here, we're done with that one. So this family here, this is an adaptive family. So it's kind of doing the same thing as we did before. But one of the advantages of this is to come in and be able to just pick points. So this is an adaptive family. You can start to see, and I'm going to hide the extrusion here real quick, that you've got these adaptive points. You've got one, two, three, and four adaptive points. And these adaptive points are allowing us to kind of come through and just snap in the object and have it adjust and update as it goes through. Okay? So actually I'm going to come in here and undo deleting this because one thing that might not happen is so let's say you come in here and somebody goes in and says, okay, here's my family and I'm going to re-edit the profile and this line now needs to be three feet tall. So they come in here and they adjust this, well, this foundation is still sitting down here. Well, I did make this instance base so I can align and lock and, and adjust what's going on with this. So I can, I can align it up. Oops, I'm going to have to stretch it in the elevation, or did I undo too far? Nope, I didn't undo too far. So I, I can pull this down, but every time the wall adjusts, I'm going to have to come back here and adjust this, adjust this, adjust this. If I delete this, and I go back and take this family and load this family into a project, I um, don't need to save it, so I'm going to go ahead and load this into my project. What's nice about this is I can now pick one point, pick two points, pick three points, and pick four points. Uh-oh, did I go backwards? I haven't used this one in a while. One, two, maybe it's three, four. I thought I had it right. Uh-oh. See, this is what happens when you do everything live on the scene. Let me delete this one and see if I can get it to work over here. So, family, structural foundations, that's framing. Uh, oh, it's not. So that's the other thing about this. Sorry, this is going to be a generic model. So one thing about doing it this way as well is if you try to do this, it cannot be classified as a structural foundation. Oh, I think I did it backwards, so we'll try this again. So it's one, two, come on, host on that endpoint, spin the model here, three, oh, I missed it. I know this one's going to freak out because I missed those two points. Let's try one more time. One, two, three. Wow, I really don't know why this isn't working. I've used this hundreds of times. Let me go back and look at the family. Just how it is today. One point, two point, three point, four point, yeah. The full depth, this should be top, and that should be the full depth. I don't know why this is not working. Um, location, vertical, that could be the problem. Let me try this. Maybe I missed this one. 
to do them all the same. Yeah. Let's try reloading this then. This is going to be one thing I was going to point out. So maybe at one of the points in times I've demoed this, I forgot to adjust that point. So let's try it one more time. Oh. Oh. I really don't know why this isn't working. I've used this a hundred times. I've given this to several clients, so hopefully it's not um, <laughs> not working for these clients. Well, there there goes BD Mackey Consulting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why this isn't working. Okay, well, I was going to show you this, but it kind of looks like we're having issues. Maybe we'll try recreating. But the whole point, oh, this is length. No, that's right. So this is what it's doing. I should actually say width. But, um so I don't know what the problem is, but one thing I was going to talk about this that is a disadvantage where I was talking about the other families is with adaptive component families, if I go into the family types, I can't make structural foundations out of these adaptive component types. So one of my biggest frustrations of adaptive families is you can use them to create a tremendous amount of data and help you create some great content, but you are very limited to the categories. So right now, this is just a generic model. So if I go put this into the project, I was wishing it would work, um, I put it into the project, then I can't make it a structural foundation. So when I go into my visibility graphics and I say, hey, I want all these structural foundations to be dashed, these are not going to become dashed. So I keep hoping that Autodesk will open it up to some other capability for us, but they just haven't done it yet. So it's really it's a little bit frustrating, but I was kind of hoping you know they would get some of that fixed. I'm just still confused on why this is not working. I used this family like two weeks ago. It, it, it'll work after we're done. It'll work after we're done. I'll get out of here. I'll place it again. So one, two, three, four. It's at the base. The step is doing it. If I take this in and move it over, it should be fine. And if this one goes up, oh, maybe that's my problem. I got something freaking out there. I don't know. Got a little something making it. Well, we'll create it from new, and maybe the, the new one I create this will work. So I'm going to create a new adaptive component family rather than dwelling on this one, and hopefully this one will work. So new family. And so when you get into this, a generic model adaptive, you can come in here, and that's just what I'm going to make this, just a generic model adaptive. Now, adaptive component families, um, they're, they're kind of weird the way they work, is the fact that you're going to use points to drive most of what you're looking for. So we're done with that one. So you're going to use points to drive most of what you're looking for here. So as you can see, there's four points. And then these four points are going to be pushing what the extrusion is going to be doing. And what should be happening in this as I go through and do this is as these points move, it's going to adjust some issues there. And I know what the problem is, I think. If I take this, uh, profiles were not locked. I bet it will work in the project now. Let me try it one more time. Load this into the project. I think the profile's got unlocked. See, the problem is when you have families that you use all the time and you demo those families and you break the families as you're demoing them, it's not always a good thing. Oops. And remember to put them back the way you found them. Yeah, so you try not to save. But then sometimes you just forget and you save, and hopefully this should work now. Nope, it's not. Okay, so it wasn't that issue. So we'll go through and create another. But you'll see you've got these adaptive points, and then those adaptive point families, you can start going through and using them to create content for you. So I'm going to go ahead and get into my project. So I'm going to start creating some points. So I'm going to make this work plane active just because I like to. It's not like it really matters in the Revit world. So I'm just going to go uh, make this active before I go place these points. Because then when you start placing the points, those points are going to be associated to that. And I'm going to be a little bit anal and go and adjust these. But once you get these points in here, what you'll see is you select them and you make those points adaptive. And each point will then have a number. Here's point one, here's point two, here's point three, here's point four. It doesn't necessarily matter, but if you're like me and it drives you a little bit crazy, you can align these things just to help your mind understand how they're getting built or what these points are being used for. But you've got the distance and the capability to do these. <clears throat> you also have the capability to start hosting other points on these. And this family that I had was um, kind of old and might not even be mine as I'm thinking about it because I have a different version. But a lot of the stuff, you're going to start coming through and hosting on what needs to go here. So here's point one, two, three, four to get this set up. 
But what I want to do is figure out what the depth of this is going to be going from here to here. So I'm going to go ahead and host another point on an already existing point. So I'm going to take this point two, and I'm going to set this point there and give myself that value. And if I grab that point, did I hit escape before I place that point? I might have. Nope, there's two points there. There it is. I'm going to go in here and see there's this offset value, and I'm going to parameterize this offset value and call it the flat distance. All right, because now what I can do is come up here to my parameters, grab that flat distance, and make it like a foot, and you'll see that point gets offset a foot from that reference. <clears throat> okay, so now I've got the flat distance. The other thing that I like to do is take top distance here and do the same thing. So reference plane, let's put a point on, let's set the work plane to be this point up here, grab that point. Sometimes it's difficult to grab it. Grab the offset value and give it a parameter of length. And then we'll go into my properties and say, gee, you know what, the length needs to be six feet. And so now you can see I'm starting to get these points set up from where I wanted them to be. So I almost forget why I put reference plane three in there. I'm going to delete that one for now. So I got one, two, and three. So I'm going to come in here now and just do some reference lines. And I'm going to turn 3D snapping on to make sure I'm actually clicking the 3D snapping of this object. And I'm going to do one more reference line going from this point to that point. Okay, so I've got all these reference points and these reference lines. And I'm just going a little bit crazy here, so I want these two to line up. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'm going to take this, these reference lines, pick this reference line here, and say create form. And what it's going to do is take these planes and sweep them along that bottom. So now basically I've got that same family we just created. We're going to try loading this one in and see if we can get this one to work. So here's my point one, here's my point two, and here's my point three. And I am really having issues with this today. I don't know why I am struggling so bad. Point one, point two, point three. Yeah, I, I don't know. You haven't, is it, maybe it's not the form or the, the piece, but it's the wall somehow or other. No, I, it should be working. Cause, oh, and unless I grab these ones, and it's the same issue I had before. Let me try this last option. Let's say vertical on placement. So anyways, you guys can tell it's live. You always know it's live when the presenter screws up multiple times on the same thing that he's done a thousand times in his, in his life. Well, speaking, of, speaking of the fact that it's live, it will be recorded. <laughs> yes, this is recorded, so maybe we'll just cut the whole second half of this we, out. We and may have we'll to say, edit a little bit here. Yeah, we'll say, hey, welcome to the end. Well, it's trying to put it in there a little bit more. Yeah, I don't, with a little bit more effort than before there, but... Uh, well, theoretically, what should happen is, yeah, it's not even going to do it there. I'll just put one in and hit escape, and it'll put it in that way. So what should happen, what I was trying to show you guys, is by doing the one, two, three on the host, is if the wall adjusted, that adaptive component would adjust with it. So as your wall step changes, you don't even have to think about it. One of the true problems of doing this, however, is it's a pain on a very large project to start placing these, because you pretty much have to be in 3D view to place them, because you've got to see the one corner, the other corner, and the top. So you've got to start like grabbing a wall on the foundation and isolating them before you put the next one in. So it ends up being this weirdness as you get into it that these sometimes look great, but they really become a pain if you're putting in a couple hundred of these on a very complicated project that, oh, wow, it's, it's kind of a pain to put them in. But the benefit of the pain of putting them in is you never have to adjust them later. So I don't know why it's not working. I wish I had an answer for you guys. We might have to do a follow-up. I should try putting it on the same one. Yeah, I'm just confused. I am just confused. I can't get it to work anywhere. Well, Brian, what else have you, what else have you got? I'll try and help you free yourself from this one. I know how you love to figure something out, though, when it's not working. So, Well, we've got five minutes left, so that was pretty much the thing talking about parameters is, you know, the big thing when you start creating content, especially standard families, is to do all of that with reference planes. 
Reference planes, reference planes, reference planes, going back to the dimensions. And there, that way, once you get into the dimensions, you start flexing the model that way. I've seen people create family content where they're just dimensioning to extrusions, and you can. But as you get more and more complicated with your families, I guarantee those are going to start to break on you. So think about the reference planes. Think about the is reference when you're going through and setting those up. And really start to understand what's going on inside of there. And then just since you know we're in the, the method of breaking things, I do want to kind of show you guys that if we take this beam right now, we can go into the um, architecture or structure command and do an opening by face. And we can pick the vertical face of this beam to put an opening in. Of course, I've got to put a radius in there because, you know, we know there's no square openings in steel beams. So I put that opening in that face. It worked really easy. Right? I just picked opening by face. I haven't tried this in 14, so it might work. But if I go edit this family, I want to show you guys what I was talking about on the center, left, right, front, back, etc. cetera, um, work planes, is if I take this, and change this from is reference to center front back to left to right and reload this into my project. It's going to say I can't even have that opening in there. I've got to delete the opening. So what's really weird about that is what I was trying to say with the reference planes, make sure you're paying attention and leaving them the way they are when you get into there. Now I do opening by face and that face isn't even an opening, an option that I can choose. Because Revit understands that that center left right or it should be there. It just doesn't let you choose it. So when you are in a family and you're looking at it in plan, this side is always the left, this side is always the right. Pretty much don't care what type of family it is. That's true when you get into there. So when you start seeing, you know, center left right, center front back, this really needs to be, in this case, the center front back. And this one here really needs to be the center left right. Start breaking that scenario and that philosophy. It just does kind of weird things, especially in the structural world. So, Brian, tell folks how they can get a hold of you if they want to. So, if you guys have any more questions or if you want to see a follow-up on that stupid thing that I screwed up massively on, um, you can Google the Revit Geek. Um, my website's bdmackieconsulting.com, but easier to find me just by Googling the Revit Geek. Or you can always give us a call here at CAD1 and... We'll track him down for you as well, and uh, you can also look at our class schedule for a lot of classes coming up on everything from Revit Structure to Revit Architecture to Civil 3D to our new InfraWorks classes and so forth and so on. I do want to give everybody a little heads up. We're trying to make sure everybody's aware of a couple things coming up here. Uh, Autodesk will be, once again, raising subscription prices a little bit on some products. Uh, in roughly the late March to early April time frame, we're told right now. We should have a, f a hard date next week, I guess. Um, so if you've got a subscription that is due any time before, say, mid-June, give us a call so we can help you get, that, get some savings on that subscription renewal. And the other thing that's coming up uh, as of February 1st, 2015, there will no longer be upgrades in the world of Autodesk. In other words, if you have old software, anything older than the current software, you will not be able to upgrade it. They are trying to get everybody on subscription so it stays current, so that they can eliminate a lot of the problems. Uh, you know, if you're cynical, you can say so they can uh, make more money, whatever the case may be. But um, if you do have old software, uh, give us a call. We'd like to get you upgraded. Make sure you protect your assets on that. Um, you thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? And uh, also get you on subscription. Also, last but not least, 2008 software is retiring as of March 31st. Uh, will be no longer upgradable at that point. So if you do have some 2008 software, please give us a call and let us let us help you protect what you paid a dang lot of money for in the first place. So there's no, so right, right now I have several clients, Dan, who, you know, during the economic downturn, they lost some employees, so they had 10 licenses, they downgraded it to eight or four or whatever right. it was. If they want to keep the value of those five that they got rid of or whatever, they should probably get those upgraded before. Before February 1st of, two, or actually by January 31st of uh, 
2015, so roughly a year from now. Um, if they don't and they let them sit idle, then when they do need that software, they'll have to pay the price of a, a new seed of software. And we just don't want to see that happen to anybody if we can we can avoid it. And, you know, if they're never going to use those seats again, well, uh, case or all, or all, I guess. But if they do plan on ramping up or they do see projects coming their way, um, please take care of that uh, so that you don't get stuck with paying more than you should have to on this stuff. And this webcast was recorded, so it should be posted to the CAD1 webinar website, or if you Google YouTube, it's CAD1 Presents. So if you want to see me struggle for 20 minutes on that family <laughs> again and again. We'll, and we'll again, try and edit it. Uh, feel if, free to go we'll see if Denny can webcast. edit it. Anyway, thanks a lot, folks. Uh, look for Revit Radio in about a month from now, and also uh, another Brian Mackey webinar right after Revit Radio. And we sure appreciate you watching out for us. Let's see, February 13th, so it should be about March 13th, if I remember right, Brian, for Revit Radio it's and your the next second webinar. second Thursday of the month. So. Yep. All right, folks, thanks a lot. See thanks, you later. Everyone.